so I normally I would put things in the chat and you can look at them before we start, but I didn't do that tonight. But I wanted to welcome everybody to the uh, Situate Historical Society GAR Hall Special Event Zoom Edition. Tonight we've got Christopher Daly. Some of you may remember him from Sokol and Vanzetti, and you may remember him from um, No Irish Need Apply. That was the last actually in-person um, production that we did. So um, anybody is welcome to come to these. Uh, Seth, can you keep an eye on the waiting room? I'm sorry. Uh, yes, absolutely, I will. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody is welcome to come. There is no fee. You know, we don't ask um, for any um, anything in return for this. We just wanted to do this for the community. But if you feel like you would like to make some sort of a donation, we would gladly accept it and we would truly appreciate it. We do have a PayPal account. It's paypal.me slash SHS1636. So um, if, you know, if the spirit moves you and you, you know, you'd like to send us a small donation, that would be fabulous. Or you can actually send a check to the Historical Society as well. So I'll just give you a brief um, idea of what's coming up. Um, next week, I believe, we have um, Jeremy D'Entrema. Some of you remember him, the lighthouse guy. He will be doing a presentation on haunted lighthouses. And it will actually be Jeremy's last, we call it live, but it's his last presentation that he'll be doing um, about lighthouses. He's gone on to other things. He's working with the government, um, restoring lighthouses, and he's doing all sorts of great things. So we're very excited to have him um, next week. In December, we're going to have Sal St. George, who is going to do a presentation on the making of it's a Wonderful Life. I know a lot of people love that movie, so he will be here. We'll also have a presentation of um, A Christmas Carol, which will be performed by members of the Hattrick um, Theater Company out of Plymouth. And you might see yours truly on the screen as well. And in January, we'll be bringing in um, Victoria Price I think a lot of you probably know Vincent Price. This is his daughter, and she's going to do a presentation all about his life as well. And then we've got J um, Jim Glinsky is coming back to talk about um, the history of the Situate Fire Department. And Herb Cream will be back talking about the Red Sox. And we've got another few other things that I'm working on as well. So. With that being said, I hope we'll see you back for all of our uh, presentations. But right now I am going to have Christopher, just give me a moment here. We are going to spotlight Christopher and he is going to start his, product, his uh, presentation on 1620, the first year. Okay, let me just uh, share my presentation screen. Okay, folks, uh, thank you for having me back to Situate again. Uh, it is truly a pleasure. Uh, I wish we were all together uh, in person, but uh, due to circumstances, we, we can't do that. So this is the next best thing. Uh, and I, I'm coming at you with a, a new presentation. Uh, I developed this over the course of the last two years. And uh, I, I knew that the 400th was coming up, and I, I knew that people would be very interested in the, the pilgrims once again. Um, but my interest in the pilgrims goes back years and years and years. Uh, uh, I'd like to give you a little background on this. Uh, I grew up in Pembroke, and uh, I'm just a hop, skip, and a jump from Plymouth. And uh, early on, I became very interested in local history. Eventually, I became the uh, president of the Pembroke Historical Society. And I ran into several people in my life that were left, uh, I guess you could say mentors. One was Russell Gardner. I don't know if any of you remember him, but he was very well known throughout the South Shore. He was also known as Great Moose. He was the historian of the Wampanoag people. 
And years ago in my 20s, I would just go over to his house in, in Halifax and, and chat with him for hours and hours and hours. And I really grew to love this history, this dual history of both the pilgrims and the natives in that, that first year, that first few years. And then years later, I came in contact with a gentleman by the name of Jim Baker. He was once the head historian at Plymouth Plantation, and we were uh, both working at the John Alden House in Duxbury. I was a docent, he was the curator. And we had long hours just sitting there together waiting for tours. It wasn't the biggest tourist attraction. And I got an education talking to this man. He, if you've ever met him, he is a walking encyclopedia of everything to do with the pilgrims in Plymouth. And uh, through him, I was able to learn about all the primary sources. I devoured them and uh, became a, a little bit knowledgeable myself. I would say I'm not an expert in everything Plymouth or pilgrims like he is, but I, I know a good deal about it. So I, I put this together, and uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoy talking about this. Now, one thing about this lecture, it's, it's a topographical and a historical lecture. That means we're going to be looking at a lot of maps. The thing I like about the Pilgrims and the history of Plymouth is that it's all within a, a, a less than a day's drive. And you can see all these places that we're talking about. Now, I have my website up here. As you can see, I'm not the best web designer in the world, but what I've done is I've created a little booklet that you can go onto my website and just download. It's free. If you have Google, it's, it's a Google Doc. And uh, what this is, is uh, it's a little booklet of uh, all the locations that we'll be talking about, how to get there, uh, in the actually the GPS coordinates. Here's, here's an example of one of the pages. And if you're interested, you can download this and you can go out and see these places for yourself. Uh, part of the fun of putting this lecture together was I did this. I went to all of these places and I visited them. And these are places that I had been to uh, many times before. But if you've never been there, this is a good uh, opportunity to visit these places. So again, I, I usually show this at my um, my live events. We'll we'll have a Q and A at the end if you'd like to do that. Also, most of the qu uh, quotations from this are from Mort's Relation, which was a booklet that was written by uh, William Bradford uh, and um, Brewster. Uh, and uh, uh, also William Bradford's Of Plymouth Plantation. All dates are in uh, the Julian calendar. Okay, so who were the pilgrims? This, this picture, uh, it's kind of funny, yes. But this is what most people know about them because this is what they teach about in the elementary schools. All the pilgrims were this group of people who came over here seeking religious freedom. That's usually never talked about too much in depth. And then they had a big dinner with the Indians. And here we have it. This is what most people know about them. And you know, there's much more, much, much more to the, the pilgrims than just Thanksgiving. And let's look at this. Now, a lot of people make the mistake of calling the pilgrims Puritans, although they were very similar. I, I want to tell you the difference between the Puritans and what the pilgrims were. They were called separatists. Now, during uh, the time of the pilgrims, prior to the pilgrims, there was a period known as the Reformation, and it literally started with this man. This is Martin Luther. He has some gripes against the Catholic Church and went and nailed them to the cathedral. He thought that they would be redressed, but they were not. And he ended up pulling out of the Catholic Church and creating the Lutheran Church, the first Protestant church. Now, this set off a lot of different theologies in this time. Now, there was another theology that came out of this man. Maybe you know who this is. This is Henry VIII. 
And believe it or not, he was a staunch Catholic. He even wrote a book in defense of Catholicism against Lutheranism. But he pulled the, the, the church in England away from the Catholic church, and we know why, because he could not get a divorce or an annulment. Uh, and he created the Church of England, the Anglican Church. Now, if you were to go into an Anglican church today, you would think you were in a Catholic church. And there were a lot of people out there in England who were hearing these new Reformation thoughts, these new Protestant thoughts, and they were against the, some of the things that the Catholic church was doing. And the Anglican church was just a mirror of the, the Catholic church. The only difference was uh, Henry VIII was the Pope for all intents and purposes. This is where the Puritans come in. They were people who believed in the theology of this man. This is John Calvin. And John Calvin uh, believed that uh, believers, believers in Christianity should only go by what's in the Bible. Uh, don't go by conclaves. Don't go by popes. Don't go by great meetings of, of churchmen. Just go by simply what's in the Bible. In fact, they even went back to the Bible and they said, look at this Bible. It's in Latin. It's been, it's been translated twice. How much has been left? And they went back to the original Greek and translated the original Greek into English. This is called the Geneva Bible, which these Puritans used. Now, the word Puritan comes to us because they were fed up with the Church of England because the Church of England looked just like the Catholic Church. And they wanted to get it back to the original church, the, the simpleness of the original church, without all the finery and statues and the robes and the incense and all that stuff. So they wanted to purify the Anglican Church. They wanted to purify it of everything that was Roman, everything that smacked of Catholicism. Now, this, this is an example to show you the contrast of a Puritan church. This is the ship's church over in Hull. And uh, look at it. Do you see any crosses? Do you see any statues? No, it's bare bones. This is where the term fundamentalist comes from because they, they believed in just the fundamentals. Now, the pilgrims, I guess you could say, were radical Puritans. They were so radical, they had gotten fed up with the whole deal of trying to purify the Anglican church, and they separated. They left the church. This is where you get the term separatists. And they actually separated to the point where they left England. They left England, and they went to uh, Holland, and they settled, they eventually settled in Leiden, Holland, and they spent quite a, quite a long time here. Uh, now, the reason they went to Holland was because uh, Holland allowed freedom of religion, oddly enough, and they could practice their version of Christianity without being persecuted by the royalists, the Anglicans in England. And the thing was, after a while, uh, they became afraid because their children were becoming too Dutch. And they wanted to remain British. They wanted to remain English. They wanted to keep that Englishness with them. And they started looking for other places to go where they, where they could just practice their religion alone without any outside influences. And this is where the merchant adventurers came in. The merchant adventurers were a group of English investors whose capital funded the Pilgrim Voyage on the Mayflower. Now, they were a, jo a joint stock company, and what they were doing here was they, they wanted to send a group to America, and they believed that they could make a profit from this, from the fur trade, from fishing, anything they could sell uh, from America. Now, the Pilgrims, they just wanted to get out of uh, Holland, and they wanted to get to America to be by themselves so they could worship on their own. So they made a, a deal with this group called the Merchant Adventurers to come to America. They would be financed by the Merchant Adventurers, 
And in return, they would set up a colony and start shipping stuff back to England so these guys could make a lot of money. So two ships, which were financed by the merchant adventurers, set out in August 5th, 1620. Uh, the Mayflower and another ship called the Speedwell. All of the pilgrims were loaded on both ships. Now they got out to sea and they quickly realized that the Speedwell was not seaworthy and they had to go back to Plymouth where they had taken off, Plymouth, England. And then they realized that they had to cram as many people on the Mayflower to go back and some were left behind and they started off again. The Mayflower set out on September 6, 1920. Now, if you look at this map, this is what their original destination was. Now, I'm going to point over here. They were headed for Virginia. Now, when you think of Virginia, you think of the state of Virginia. Back then, the colony of Virginia was just in, in its infancy. And it, it was basically everything from New York down to what is Virginia now, the Chesapeake Bay. And they were headed about to where Hudson's, the Hudson River was, where there was already a Dutch colony already there, but they wanted to plant their colony in this vicinity. That's where they were originally headed. Now they were blown off course and they went a little bit north. And when they made landfall, they made land sighted at November 9th, 1620, and they were off the coast of Cape Cod. Now, the captain of the Mayflower, his name was Christopher Jones, and he realized that he was way off course. So what they decided to do was, to, uh, once they sighted that, that coast, they, they knew from John Smith's map where they were. They knew they were off course, pretty far off course, and they had to go south. So this shows their, their voyage. They decided to head south towards Hudson River, but they ran into some trouble here off the coast of what is now Chatham at a place called Pollock's Rip. Now Pollock's Rip is this location where there are very shallow shoals. There's been many shipwrecks here. It was stormy and they could have run aground. That Mayflower could have smashed and we would never hear of these pilgrims. It would have been a footnote in history. Captain Christopher Jones knew they were in dire, dire danger here, and he turned the ship around and he followed the coast, and they decided to anchor right off here in, Clinton, in um, Cape Cod Harbor. Now, I'm going to show you where they actually landed. This is the site of the November 11th landing. And we all know what that is. That's the tip of the cape. Here we have where Provincetown is. And to show you where the Mayflower was, this is where they anchored. It was November 11th, 1620. Now, there was quite a discussion on board. They were outside the bounds of Virginia. They were outside the bounds of British law. That meant that there was no law they were outside of their patent, their charter. They had to decide what they wanted to do. There were some people on board that were like, woo woo, we don't have any law, we can do whatever we want. But the, the, the cooler heads sat down and they said, look, we have to establish a temporary government of our own until we can get a patent, which is permission from the royal government to, to have a settlement here, you, you, which you would be under British law. And, and within a year, they would have that patent. But this, this document that they drew up, the Mayflower Compact, established this government. And they agreed to have a democratic government, and they agreed that they would elect a governor and that the, the laws would be democratically decided upon. This was called the Mayflower Compact. It was drawn up on November 11, 1620, before they stepped foot on what is now American soil. So let me show you the, the exact landing place. If you've ever been to the Cape, you might recognize this area. There's a little jetty here. The Provincetown Inn is right here. Let's go down. And this is a, this is a, 
a base relief in Provincetown showing the signing of the Mayflower Compact. Now this is a map and you can get this in my little booklet here. This shows the actual landing site. The actual landing site, or as I say, probable landing site because of erosion, uh, was where you see A. B is where there, was, there is a uh, monument to this landing. And C is uh, the rotary around the monument. Let's look at it from satellite, okay? So this beach here is probably where they landed. Now, what, when I say probably, it was probably more out uh, about here or even further out due to erosion. Now, let's look at this. Here is a, a famous painting uh, that you can see at the, the uh, Forefathers Monument or, or the Pilgrim Monument in P-Town of the landing of the Pilgrims, the first landing. No, it wasn't on Plymouth Rock. Here is the monument that I spoke of, and that is inside the rotary there. And you see this commemorates the first landing of the Pilgrims. Now I took this shot, I went out in back of the Provincetown uh, Inn and took this shot. So this is the beach where they actually landed. Now, if you can imagine the first Monday, this is what happened. Here is the beach. And on the first Monday, the women came on shore and the first thing they did was the laundry. Now, for, for eons, it was tradition in New England, all over New England, that Monday was wash day. And this can be traced back to this day, November 13, 1620. Now, there were three separate uh, expeditions of Cape Cod. Now the objective, there were two objectives here. One objective was to find uh, the native population and try to make contact with them for trade and also to find out about the area. The other was to find a suitable place to seed a colony. Now, uh, the maps I will be using here, the one that you see here was the HM Dexter map, which was part of the uh, I think it was the 1865 edition of Mort's Relation. And uh, that will be compared with some actual satellite uh, images to show you uh, the places that they went on these expeditions. So our first one is, we look at this here. And the first expedition set off day one, 16 men, came ashore. Now, they did not come in the shallop. Uh, maybe you've been, been to uh, Plymouth and you've seen the shallop, which is a rather big ship that they carried inside the Mayflower, but it was still in pieces inside the Mayflower at this time, and the ship carpenter was busily putting it together. Now, uh, they came on shore, and immediately they saw five men with a dog in the distance. They realized these men were natives. They began to follow the men, and these five men with the dog quickly realized that they were being followed, and they ran into the woods. And this 16-man uh, unit here gave chase. So they decided to try to follow them to make contact. This is the point where they f first saw these people, and this is the track that they took into the woods following these five men and a dog which were probably members of the Nauset tribe. And this is all from Dexter's map. And what he did was he read Mort's relation and he tried to recreate as best he could the track of these, uh, these uh, explorers, you could say. And here we have it going through modern day uh, P-Town. This is where they went. Uh, they, uh, when they lost sight of these men, they could track them. They could see their tracks in the dirt. And mind you, at this time, the great dunes that you see out there were not there. It was totally wooded. So you see these dunes here. Some of these dunes were not here. 
And here is the, the second part of the route, if you see here. Now, on the old map, it was called Negro Head. Today, this is Oak Head for obvious reasons. And this shows the actual track. And they get to the top of the hill, and they see these men in the distance, and they keep following them. And then from there, and this is all in one day, folks. What a walk. And then if you look here, uh, what is now Pilgrim Lake today, it's enclosed. Back then, it was open, and it was an open harbor. This area that you see here, which uh, was known as Stouts Creek, was probably in this vicinity here. It's all covered by uh, sand today. So here is the track. And they went through here, and this is where they decided to camp for the night at a location called Stouts Creek. And here is a view uh, looking over Pilgrim Lake, and Stouts Creek would probably just be about here. And I hiked into the dunes to try to find any remnants of uh, some kind of creek. And you can kind of see here that there, there was probably once a waterbed here. But the importance of this location, and there is no monument out here, the importance of this location is this is the location of where the pilgrims spent their first night on American soil. And this is where they camped the first night. Now that brings us to day two. They woke up and they continued to track those natives. And they went through an area of uh, brambles. And there's a quote here that says that uh, the underbrush was so bad that it tore at our armor. And they walked all the way to this location. And uh, this is an easy place to access. This is where they found their first drink of American water. There's a little path that you can go through the woods from a parking lot to this location. And you will find this monument here. And I'll just let you read that for a second. This is where they found a, a spring. And it seems that they were very, very thirsty. Here's a little video I made. Let me read you a quote. This is from Morton's Relation. Found a fresh spring of water of which we were heartily glad and sat us down and drank our first New England water with delight as we ever drunk, drink in all of our lives. And that you see right there, folks, is the exact spring that they drank that water from. Here's a painting de depicting that moment. If you've ever been really thirsty, I think you know how they felt here. And this is called Pilgrim Spring. Now, from there, uh, they went to the coast, and they set a signal fire so the Mayflower knew that they were okay, and then they continued. They continued down the coast to a location that is now called Pilgrim Pond in Truro. Here is the location. This has markers, and... Uh, at this point, they just kind of made note of it and went by it, but later they would come back and camp here. And as you see, there's a, a marker here as well. A beautiful location. And here's a video I took uh, at um, dusk one day. So from Pilgrim Pond, they made a beeline down the coast. And they got to an area. And here's a quote. We found a little path to certain heaps of sand. 
one whereof was covered with old maps and a woolen thing like a mortar overwhelmed on top of it. An earthen pot lay a little hole at the end thereof. We must say what it might be, digged and found a bow, and we thought arrows, but they were rotten. We supposed that there were many other things, but because we deemed them graves, we put in the bow again and made it up as it was and left the rest untouched because we thought it would be odious unto them, meaning the natives, to ransack their sepulchres. So it's on this path that they found some graves of the natives. And then they continued to an area called Corn Hill. We'll focus in on Corn Hill here. And we're still in the town of Truro. Here it is from satellite view. And here is a video. There's a parking lot not close uh, too far. That's Corn Hill in the distance. There is a monument there as well. And when they got up here, they found the remnants of village. It seems that it was a summer village and it had been, been abandoned for the winter. And it probably looked more like that. Uh, and also when they uh, sculpted around, they found a large iron uh, cask there or, or a um, cauldron, which indicates that they had had some contact with the, the Europeans because the natives didn't have the capacity to make this. It was actually a, a shipped cauldron. And they also found buried under mats, sea corn in these bags. Now, sea corn was buried by the natives for use in the spring to plant their crops for the next year. And they would hide them in the ground for that time. So the, the pilgrims, knowing that they were low on supplies, knowing that uh, probably they'd have a real hard time to survive the winter, decided to take that seed corn. Knowing that it was seed corn and that some village would be without their seed corn the next year, but they had no other choice. They were facing starvation and they planned to recompense the natives at some point in the future pay them back for the sea corn, which they actually did about a year later. Here is the monument by Corn Hill, what is called Corn Hill. And most of these monuments were placed here uh, in the 1920s by uh, the daughters, the uh, daughters of the revolution. Here's a very famous painting showing them uh, hoisting that uh, corn out of there. Now, they, uh, after that, they made a, another short expedition to the south, to this location, which is the mouth of the Pamit River. And uh, according to Mort's relation, they found uh, a palisade, which is kind of a wooden wall that they deemed had been built by some Christians. Now, uh, they don't guess at who it is, but if you do a little research, you can find that in about this area, there was an expedition in 1603 by a, a captain called Martin Pring, and they stayed there for several months harvesting sassafras. They loaded their ship up and went back to England. I guess sassafras had some medicinal purpose, and it was very valuable back then. So I'm guessing that palisade they found was that of Martin Frey. And then from there, they went back to Pilgrim Pond and they camped the night. They sank that cauldron full of corn into the water. And then uh, in the morning, they set a signal fire and did a little bit more expedition there. They, they did a little bit more skulking around here. And uh, during this time, there was kind of a comical event that happened. Uh, William Bradford, Governor Bradford, actually got caught in a deer trap and it yanked him up and he was hung by a tree by his leg. And it, it's kind of uh, uh, jokingly recounted uh, about this funny event. 
And I think they had had it for their, their little expedition at this point. And they decided to uh, send two men out with their matchlocks and uh, make some signal shots so the Mayflower could send the longboat and they could uh, get that kettle that they had submerged, get the corn and bring it back to the Mayflower. So that was the first expedition of Cape Cod. They didn't really find any place suitable to, to live at this point. They didn't come in contact with any Native Americans. So they decided on a second expedition. Now the second expedition focused around the Pamit River, which they, they had been uh, in that area previously. And now the shallop was ready. 24 men this time, and Captain Christopher Jones was in charge. Now that first night was kind of windy, it was kind of uh, stormy. Some of the men decided to camp on land and some of the men decided to spend the night in the shallop. I don't think I'd uh, choose the shallop. Now this is to show you where they were. Let's focus down here. This is the Pamit River. And they began their expedition the shallop going up the river and some men walking on land beside the river. Now they went through Hill and Dale, and then they, they got to about this point. They, they stopped shy of the other side because uh, it looks like from reading Mort's that they thought that this land was really not suitable. They didn't like it very much. So they decided that they would uh, turn back the next day. So this is approximately where they camped that night. And then they turned back and uh, headed back the same way here with the shallop following. Now, this is where the shallop was sent back with uh, uh, some of the corn they had in 18 men. Mortz re refers to these men as the weakest. They were sent back and some of the men were left on shore to continue looking for uh, any Native Americans or uh, any, any uh, place that would be suitable to live. So they spent that night at Corn Hill and then they began to search around the area some more and this is, this is the approximate route they took. And here they found something that, that has fascinated me for years. It's at this location that they found a grave of a man with yellow hair and a small child. Let me read you the quote from Mortz. In the plain ground, we found a place like a grave, much bigger. It was covered with boards. They took up the boards to find a woven mat. Under the mat, they found bowls, trays, dishes, such like trinkets. We opened the grater and found a great quantity of fine, perfect red powder, and in it the bones and skull of a man. The skull had fine yellow hair on it and some flesh unconsumed. They were bound up, they were bound up with a knife and a pack needle and two or three old iron things. The whole thing was bound up in a sailor's canvas cassock and a pair of breeches. We opened the lesser bundle likewise and found the bones and the head of a little child. About the legs and other parts of it was bound with strings, bracelets of fine white beads. It was also a little bow about three quarters long and some other knacks. We brought sundry of the, we brought sundry of the prettiest things away with us and covered up the corpse again. So I've, I've always, uh, this has always been something that I've wondered, who was this man? Obviously, he was not a native. He had blonde hair. And I've looked into this and I've come up with my own theory. So this is a little side trip here. Here's my theory. And it goes back to our friend Squanto. Everybody who went to school knows that Squanto was the Native American who could speak English and he helped the, the pilgrims plant corn. Well, let's go back even further. How did he learn English? Squanto was actually kidnapped in 1614 by a Captain Hunt, was brought to Spain, escaped from Spain, and ended up in England. He learned English, and from there, he was hired to come back here with a Captain Dermer as somewhat of a scout 
a somewhat of an interpreter. Now, when they came back here, this was 1619. Squanto had been gone for years, and the first place that Squanto wanted to go with Dermer was his home village of Patuxet, which is approximately the location of Plymouth today. But what he found was that his entire village had been wiped out by a plague. I'll talk about that plague a little bit later. Squanto with Dermer continued to the south to the seat of power. This was the village of Sowaps. And this is the village of the Massasoit. Now I say the Massasoit because the name Massasoit means chief, the chief of the Wampanoag nation, the head chief. His name was Ostamequin or Yellow Feather. And he was the leader of the Wampanoag nation. His, his tribe was the Poconoket tribe and their village was called Sowamps. The location of Sowamps is the present town of Warren, Rhode Island. You're looking at the village right now. Pretty much all that is left, any kind of sign <coughs> of this village is a small location of what is called Mastasoyet's Spring. And this at one time was a freshwater spring and there is really nothing left today. There is a site called Burris Hill uh, to the south where they think uh, it was the burial grounds of this tribe. <clears throat> now, while they were with Massasoit, Massasoit Osamequin brought out two French captives. It seems that a ship had gone down off the coast of Cape Cod in 1617, and many of these men were captured and enslaved by the Wampanoag. <clears throat> this is probably where that ship's cattle came from, that cauldron that I showed you earlier. And my theory is that one of the men from this shipwreck probably was brought into the Nauset tribe somehow, probably integrated, maybe that was his son, buried with him. Somehow he died, somehow he was buried up there, but this is where I think that man came from. Now these two men that Massasoit presented to Dermer and Squanto were given over to Dermer and they were released. He went further up the coast to what is now Weymouth, West Augusta, and freed two more. So these men were scattered all throughout the area. <clears throat> Back to the expedition. Now, they go further here and they find an abandoned Indian village. <clears throat> and here is, uh, here's a quote about this. It says, we found uh, some Indian wigwams which had lately been dwelt in. They having their pieces, that means their weapons, and hearing nobody entered the houses and took some things. The writer notes that they had intended to have some beads to leave in a sign of peace that they meant to truck or trade with them, but this was not done because of the hasty coming to Cape Cod, they didn't have any. So they just decided to help themselves probably figuring that they could come back later and uh, give up some goods and trade. So they went back and they went back to the Mayflower. And then there was a third expedition. This time the shallop was sent out with 10 of their principal men. And this time they went further down the coast towards where the present town of Wellfleet is. Here is the uh, the uh, coast of Wellfleet. Now, they, uh, according to Mortz, they espied 10 or 12 Indians busy about a big black thing. It looks like they were cutting up a fish. Once the natives saw them, they ran on, and this is the coast that they saw these natives. And the fish that they were probably cutting up was a grampus fish, a large uh, mammal. So day one of the expedition, they headed inland, and they ended up here at uh, just about uh, northeast of Great Pond, and this is where they camped for the night. And this is a beautiful area. This is uh, at near Wiley Park in Eastham. And this is probably 
the um, approximate location of where that camp was. From Great Pond, the, the company split eight in the shallop and two on shore. Now, they found the Grampus fish that, uh, that they had been cutting up, that they had seen earlier. And then the land expedition went down the coast and they lost sight of the shallop at that point. Uh, and at this point, they go inland And they go a little bit further here. And this is where they find the site of a native graveyard. Uh, here's a quote from Moritz. They found a great burial place, a part whereof encompassed a, was encompassed by a large palisade like a churchyard. The graves were more sumptuous than the ones at Corn Hill Yet we digged none of them, but only viewed them and went on our way. We also found four or five Indian houses, but no natives. And from there, they headed to a place which is, uh, is now called First Encounter Beach. And this is where they reunited with the shallow. Here's First Encounter Beach. And this is a little video showing that beach today. They built a barricade. They pulled the shallop up on shore and they spent the night. During the night, they heard all sorts of howling noises, which they thought were animals, but probably were the Nauset Indians signaling each other in the night. So at about 5, 5 a.m., as they were waking up, they were trying to uh, transport their goods from the, the uh, barricade that they had constructed to the shallop down by the water. They were attacked by the Nauset. And <clears throat> arrows flew, musket balls were fired, and oddly enough, nobody was killed. This was the first encounter with the pilgrims and the natives, and it was an attack by the Nauset and you can understand why. Here are these folks, they come in, they start digging up graves, going through villages, taking things, and the Nauset were not happy with them, taking their corn as well. So they jumped into the shallop and they, they sailed away as quickly as they could. And if you go to uh, Eastham, you can see First Encounter Beach for yourself, and there's a little monument out there as well. Not a very good shot, I'm sorry. It looks in rough shape. It's out on the beach in that salt air. So from Eastham, they decided that maybe it's not a great place to stay on Cape Cod uh, because of the, the Nauset Indians. They weren't too happy with them. So they followed the coastline for, uh, as they said, about 15 leagues. It began to rain and snow wind was howling, uh, the hinges on the rudder broke on the shallop, and they had to use oars. And then the mast on the shallop broke. So they were trying to find anywhere to land that thing, and luckily for them, there was a little island inside what is now Plymouth Harbor. This island here, it's called Clark's Island named for the pilot of the shallop in the Mayflower, John Clark. And it was December 9th, 1620. Now on the 11th, they had, uh, it was Sabbath and they held services right by that rock that you just saw. And this is called, uh, it's embossed with the Sabbath day that they celebrated on that time, on that day. And then on December 12, 1620, they famously landed on Plymouth Rock. And here are several of, of those paintings, those romanticized 
paintings showing the landing on Plymouth Rock. Now we know that they landed in Plymouth, but the story of the rock is very dubious. And we know there were no women along the trip. So a lot of these are very exaggerated and very romanticized. Here is the only quote we have on that day. We marched also into this land and found diverse cornfields, little running brook in a place of very good situation. There is no mention of any Plymouth Rock. There is no mention of landing. So where do we get this Plymouth Rock story from? And here's a picture of the rock. And you know, I, I love to go there and just watch people. And you can tell whatever language they're speaking, they're looking down at that thing for the first time. And they look at one another and I know they're saying, is that it? Because <laughs> I think people come here and they expect the rock of Gibraltar or something. But what they find is this broken rock, this, this American icon, and there's no reference to it in the original primary source. Here's the history of Plymouth Rock. You can tell me whether you think this, is, uh, this rock is real or fake. Um, whenever I bring it up with my students, immediately they know everything. So they tell me that it's fake. Here's the story. Now, as I said, there's no mention of it in the early primary sources, but we do have in 1741, Elder Thomas Ponce, at the age of 95, heard that there was a wharf being built over the same rock. He became very agitated because he said his father, who knew the pilgrims, said that was the first rock that they landed on. And in fact, he asked to be taken out to this rock in, his, in, in, in a chair because he could not walk at this time. He laid his hand on it and the sources say that he began to weep because he believed that this rock was gonna be covered up by the, the uh, war, which later it would not be, probably because of uh, elder fonts. There is a mention of it in 715, however, on an early map as a landmark. So there is some credence to this as some sort of a landmark. 1774, the location is recorded on what is called the Blaskowitz map, an early map too. Now, it was eventually moved to this location that you see here. This is Town Square. And this took place just before the American Revolution where uh, war fervor was in the air. There was a great uh, feeling of people wanting to know more about their forefathers. And they decided to pull that rock up and move it to Town Square. However, something happened. As the oxen were pulling it up with ropes, it fell and it broke in half. Now the people at the time took this as a metaphor, that here this rock is like, is like the, the English people, the British people, and now America and England are breaking apart. Now they are two. One is independent of the other. So they brought one side of that rock up to town square and put it there at about this location you see here. And there was a, a flag placed over it in which a flag waved that said liberty or death. This is the location today. If you take a trip up uh, Lyon Street, this is the old courthouse and this is the location of where they kept that rock. And they kept it there until July 4th, 1834 where it was then moved to the location, which is uh, now Pilgrim Hall. It was moved in front of Pilgrim Hall, which was in existence in 1834, and it was surrounded with a cage. So uh, the reason originally to move it here was too many people were taking souvenirs. They were chipping it apart. And it stayed here until 1867, when down on the wharf, this, this portico, which was built by Hemet and Billings in 1867, the rock was placed here as a place of veneration. And here it remained for years and years and years 
And then finally, in 1880, they took the bottom part, which was still in the muck, where, where the original rock was, and rejoined it with the top part that was in the portico. And this is how we got that two rocks glued together that you see, you see the cement. That's when they did it in 1880 and they put it together and it was still under that portico. And that brings us to 1920, the, the 300th anniversary of the landing at Plymouth. This Roman Doric portico was constructed over the original site where that rock was for the 300th anniversary. And there is where we have the rock that we see today. Now you can uh, believe it or not, whether this is authentic or not, I tend to think it's, it's a pretty good story. Now back to the expedition, that third and final expedition returned to the Mayflower to tell them that they had found the place to settle, but there was bad news. William Bradford, when he came aboard the Mayflower, learned that his wife, Dorothy, had either jumped overboard or had slipped and fell overboard. Uh, there is no mention of it, oddly enough, in his book of Plymouth Plantation. We only know of it from Mort's relation. And she was probably buried someplace out there, somewhere around Provincetown. Now they decided that they would explore the area of Plymouth. And on December 15th, they began this. They left uh, Provincetown, the Mayflower anchored, and they began to explore. They began to explore actually on the 18th of December. By this time, there was already snow on the ground. This was not a good time to build a colony. Now, as they looked around, they found that there were no wigwams, but they mentioned that there uh, were fields where corn had been planted. But it looked like it hadn't been planted in, in a few years. Now, many people will say that the, the Pilgrim's Village, Plymouth Village, was built on top of Patoxet. I found this not to be true. I always wondered, where was this actual village of Patoxet? And in my research, I found where this, this village was. Oddly enough, I came across a 1986 article <clears throat> about an archeological discovery uh, in about this area here. A new uh, development was going through. And in the article, it noted that there were many, many, many art articles of uh, artifacts in this area. And the article actually stated that the archaeologists thought that this was actually the site of the Tuxet. Now they they didn't mention uh, they didn't mention where this was. So I wanted to find out where this was, and I went into the old records of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society, and I noted that there was uh, a survey done around Leland Way. Oddly enough, this was built in the same year of this discovery. <clears throat> and this noted that this was probably the village of Patuxet. So on my uh, little booklet, I have this place marked. Uh, there's an open field where they think the village might have been. It's private property. Um, so you probably need permission to go in there. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the, the village of Patuxet had been wiped out by a great plague. <clears throat> Indians of the East Coast uh, had been uh, wiped out almost completely. Uh, the sources say 80 to 90 percent of the natives on the coast <clears throat> had been wiped out. Uh, this village of Patuxet, there was nobody left. When Squanto came back, his whole family was gone. And when we get a quote here, this is from uh, Thomas Ma uh, Morton uh, from New England, Canaan, and he had a little <clears throat> quote on his findings when he came here in the 1620s. Uh, he said, for in a place there were many inhabited, there hath been but one left alive to tell what became of the rest, the living being, as it seems, not able to bury the dead. They were left, they were left for the crows, the kites, and the vermin to prey on. 
and the bones and the skulls upon several places of their habitations made such a spectacle after my coming into those parts, it seemed to me a newfound Golgotha. <clears throat> now, many people will tell you that um, this was probably some European disease, smallpox maybe, uh, something that the natives did not have an immunity to. But oddly enough, if you look at the symptoms, uh, the symptoms were headache, fever, bleeding from the nose, and jaundice. And they did have this sickness in the winter, which is not consistent with the small po uh, smallpox or yellow fever. Um, but it was, it was documented that Europeans were able to walk among them while they were sick and not catch this disease. So it does appear that the, the Europeans had some kind of immunity to this. So this is where they decided to settle. It was a good place. It had high ground, fresh water streams, and a good harbor, and the land was already cleared. This is where they would settle. This new Plymouth, as they called it. And immediately they began to build because they were running out of time. Winter was on, upon them. And it was on December 23rd when they started to build now, many people had uh, already started to become sick. People uh, had scurvy coming into this, and that lowers the immune system. And many people started to become sick as they were building. On December 25th, they, uh, this is a record, they heard noises of the Indians. So this is a quote, they heard the noises of the Indians. So the natives were in the area. They were watching this. I think they were befuddled because before, all the only, the only contact they had was with sailors that would come and kidnap them or maybe traders, fishermen. But they had never seen them build houses. They had never seen them come with women and children. So they just hung back and they watched. They were wondering, what are these people doing? And this is where they built that colony. This is the first street in New England. This is Leiden Street. Looking up here towards the church here, just beyond the church is where the first fort was built. And the, the old graveyard is back there. And just to give you an idea here, here's the, uh, the first street. If you ever go to Plymouth Plantation and you... Uh, Look down that road, that's the road. And this is what it looks like today. Here's the site of the first house built. That's, they had to build a big house so people could have shelter so they could build the other houses. And then the second thing they built was a platform upon which to put their, their uh, cannon. Now this was eventually made into a fort. And here are some depiction, depictions from the 19th century of what they thought that fort might look like. It's kind of like a old log cabin. <clears throat> when in fact, you know, they didn't use uh, logs. They didn't build log cabins. Uh, that, that was the Dutch in New York. Now, Plymouth Plantation did a lot of research into what this fort probably looked like. And they came up with this. And uh, in talking to Jim Baker, who was the former historian, he said that this was what they used in Ireland to subdue the Irish. And this is what you call a blockhouse, which is a fortress and you can mount guns up here. And they also use this as a townhouse and a church. And if you go to Burial Hill today, this is the actual site of where that fortress was. There is a marker there. And if you look very closely among the graves, you can still see the line with the, where the walls were. It's sort of a gully there. You can see the outline of the fort if you look hard enough. And here is an overlay map showing uh, once they laid out those streets, once they built those houses, and this is where they lived. This is present day Plymouth. And this is Plymouth Plantation overlaid on the modern town of Plymouth. 
And if you go down there, you'll find plaques marking a lot of these old houses. For instance, this corner is where William Bradford's house was. And if you turned around and looked across the street, over here, yes, this was the house of John Billington, the first man executed for murder. Now, on December 28th, uh, they made that plan and they laid out that street. And then uh, several days later, as they were working, they saw uh, great smokes to the south, probably in the vicinity of what uh, Middleborough now is. Um, and this could be one of two things. This could be that the Indians, they would do controlled burns to burn off the undergrowth, or it could be just simply the Native Americans kind of trying to scare the pilgrims with these great fires. We don't know. So for a long time, they, they didn't have any sightings of the Native Americans. And then on February 16th, 12 of them were sighted. This caused great alarm. They went to their muskets, they prepared for an onslaught, and none came. And then February 17th, many Native Americans appeared over a hill. And they made motions to parlay. This is the language of uh, Mort's relation. They made motions to come and speak. You know, they were like, come and speak. And uh, it said that Standish and Stephen Hopkins did the same. So they basically stood on two sides of a river saying, you come over here. No, you come over here, we'll talk. And then all of a sudden, a great sound of many natives came from behind this hill, and those men ran off. So we have the natives in the area. They know that they're being watched. And then on March 16th, a giant of a man walked in the village. His name was Samoset. He was a sachem from Maine who had been brought in by the Wampanoag to, to talk to these English and find out what was going on. He had learned English from his contact with English fishermen up in Maine. Now he came into the village and he talked with them. And this is what they learned from talking to Samoset. He, they learned that the Massasoit, the chief of the Wampanoag, was at Poconoket, Soams to the south. The Nosset were to the east on Cape Cod and they were not happy. They were mad. They were the ones that, that attacked you. And Patuxet, which would, had been nearby, had been wiped out entirely by the plague and no one possessed it. And then on March 18th, uh, Samoset came again. And he came this time with other men. Here's a quote. On this day again came the savage, brought with him five other tall and proper men. They have every man of them a deer skin or such like one on his arm. They had most of them long hosen up to their groins, close made above their groins, to the waist was leather. They were like altogether like Irish browsers. Their complexion like our English gypsies, no hair or very little on their faces, or their heads long hair to their shoulders, only cut before. Some trussed up with feathers broadwise like a fan, another foxtail hanging out. So these pictures pretty much depict what you just heard from Mort's relation here. This is what the Native Americans looked like. Now that was Samoset, and they came and they talked and they left. Then on March 22nd, he arrived with another, another Native, and this was Squanto. Now Squanto was uh, an inhabitant of Patuxet, uh, after Dermer had brought him back, he had settled back in with the Wampanoag, and he was called upon by Massasoit to make contact with these pilgrims and find out what they were about. Now, Samoset and Squanto came on March 22nd, and they told the pilgrims that Massasoit and his brother were nearby and that they were coming, and they wanted to parlay. They wanted to talk. 
And if you look here, this is an old map <coughs> of Plymouth. Here, here, thereabouts, this is about where Lydon Street is. There's an area over here called Watson's Hill. <clears throat> now, it said that on this hill, Massasoit appeared with 60 of his graves, and they stood on that hill. Edward Winslow uh, sent, was sent bearing gifts, and hostages were exchanged. And this is how Massasoit appeared. It was noted that he dressed in a single feather, only a necklace of bones separated him from the others. He came down and he was escorted to the village. <clears throat> he was brought to the common house for a parley. And it was here that they talked and they hammered out the first treaty between the Native Americans in the area and the English, which I will put up here. Now, Massasoit didn't come to the pilgrims because he wanted to help them out. He didn't feel sorry for them. He needed an ally. What was happening at this time was that the Wampanoag were extremely weak. They had been weakened by the plague. Their numbers had been diminished. And the nation to the left, which was the Narragansett, hadn't been so affected. The Narragansett were threatening the Wampanoag. And then the Wampanoag needed an ally. And here you have it. We have these English. They've got guns. They've got cannons. And they needed to make a deal. It wasn't out of uh, any kind of concern on either side. This was a pure treaty of alliance. And that it would hold up for about seven, uh, for 55 more years. And basically they agreed that if uh, somebody on their side committed a crime that they were uh, against the, the other, that they would hand them over <clears throat> and that they would come to the defense of the other if they were attacked. And this is the location of where that first meeting occurred. Not this building, but the site of that first house was right here. And there was a plaque commemorating that moment. This is the location of the first common house. Now, Time passes, and they get through that first winter. It was a wretched, horrible winter, and many, many people died. Uh, as I said, they were already diseased when they stepped foot on, on American soil. And by the time of the first Thanksgiving, over 50% of them had died. This shows you graphically the number that were gone. Now they had to bury most of these people in unmarked graves because they were afraid to give away that their numbers were diminished and that they were weakened. So they buried them up on Coles Hill. And during uh, the 300th anniversary when they were doing work on the hill and preparing the, the street, a lot of these bones were found. And initially the bones were taken and put on the, on the, in the space on the portico above Plymouth Rock. And then it was thought that the, that wasn't a very good place to put these people's bones. So they created this, this big sarcophagus, as it's called. And this is where those, those bones of those first people to die that first year rest today on Coles Hill. And then we have Thanksgiving. And this is what the pilgrims are known for. Every Thanksgiving, oh, it was the first Thanksgiving. No, it wasn't. This was a harvest festival. And the Native Americans showed up and they had venison. But it was, it was a brief shining moment where the two cultures actually shared peace and friendship. And that is what is true for a brief shining moment. It wouldn't be more than a year or two before there was war. But this was a harvest festival. It was not a Thanksgiving. If you wanna know what a pilgrim Thanksgiving was like, you're looking at it. 
a day of thanksgiving was a day of prayer and fasting and you spent the entire day in church praying so this thanksgiving think and take pause remember the story of the pilgrims and take time from the festivities to go to a quiet place and give thanks as they really did 400 years ago. And I thank you for uh, attending tonight and I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you. And I will pop out of the view here. That was okay. awesome, thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Chris. That was wonderful. Thank you. So we've got a few questions in the chat. That's great. I'd love to answer them yep. if I and can. We, and it seems like we've got quite a few uh, Mayflower descendants. Oh, yeah. Watching tonight. Actually, um, my friend Sharon is on there. Yes. And I know Robert Cheshire is one and a bunch of other people. And they've mm -hmm. been kind of having a conversation in the chat, finding oh. out they're related. So mm -hmm. that's kind of cool. So let's see what we have. Um, what is the difference um, between the calendar they used and the calendar we now use? I think it's about 10 days. Um, the, uh, the Julian calendar, you have leap year, and the Gregorian calendar, you don't. And they switched over uh, around uh, shortly after that time. Okay. Yeah, so you might have noticed that the rock had uh, a different date than I had uh, on Clark's Island. That's because of the, they were using the, um, the new style. Yeah, it gets confusing. It's about 10 days difference. Okay, that was sometimes, sometimes when you're reading sources, they'll just give both dates. Okay, and that was from Marie. Thank you, Marie. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have from Sarah. I'll bet the spring water did taste good. From yeah. what I understand, they only had beer to drink aboard yes. the Mayflower. I have also mm -hmm. read clean water was scarce in England, so beer was often the, li the liquid. It was, water. and they brought beer with them. Uh, it was weak beer. They called it ale. Um, you're right. The, there was uh, a lot of pollution. The well, some of the water in the wells wasn't really that good. And this, this was pristine, fresh water. And uh, it probably tasted better than Poland Springs, I'll bet you. It did. And they did have another drink with them called Aqua Vita, which was the hot stuff. And then they gave that to Massasoit at that little meeting they had. Okay. Um, so those are, I think, the only two question type comments, but we can open it up right now if anybody has a question they'd like to ask. Yes. Anyone just unmute your mic. Well, how about if I, um, do, 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 do. I unmute everyone. I was surprised that uh, it didn't take them very long. They left in September and they got mm -hmm. here in November. The only two months it took them to get to the yeah. destination. Yeah, yeah, two months. And uh, while at sea, they almost, uh, they were in storm, uh, stormy condition and one of the main beams broke. So they almost sank on their way over too before they even got to Pollock's Rip. It didn't know, it didn't take, it was a pretty quick voyage. For that time. This is a silly question, but how about the spelling P L I and P L Y? Yes, that? um, that's funny. That that's one of the things I would sit around and talk to Jim Baker about, and he said, "Well, at that time they didn't have dictionaries, and that was the way they spelled it then." And it's it's come now that it's spelled with the P-L-Y and it, it's funny um, oh who was that fellow that was the he uh, was the, the dean at BU uh, John Silver uh, a group of kids had written him about the Mayflower Compact and they spelled it the old way Plymouth and he chastised them for misspelling Plymouth when in fact they were spelling it the original way interesting yeah Yes. Um, in fact, uh, in Bradford's original history, 
That's how it's spelled. That's how it's spelled. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. So if you. If you look at some of the handwritten records, you can see yep. that. Some other strange spellings too. <laughs> yes. Yes. And if if you ever read uh, uh, of Plymouth Plantation and Mort's relation, uh, the spellings almost give you, you can almost hear the accent because they're spelling phonetically in a lot of cases. And you can almost hear the British uh, accent when you read the, those documents. Ah, okay. Uh, Christopher, could you talk a little bit about the, the maybe the relationships between the pilgrims and the strangers and? Oh yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, the saints and the strangers. Uh, many people think that uh, the whole ship was full of pilgrims, but it was not. There were, there were other people who just came to set up a colony. In fact, there were, there were 102 passengers, uh, 74 male, 28 female. Uh, they think about 30 to 50 were crew members, and 37 of those were the separatists. So um, many of those strangers were either people that wanted to come and settle or they were crew members. Uh, John Alden, for instance, was not one of the separatists. He was the ship's cooper. And um, they, uh, they didn't subscribe to this uh, separatist uh, philosophy. I, I think Alden eventually kind of uh, molded into it, but he, he started out as a crew member. So there um. were... 102 passengers and that included crew members or were there 102? Uh, yeah, that, everybody on ship that inc included um, the crew members. Um, third, but 37 of those passengers were said to be separatists. Okay. Yeah. Had they all, had they all come from Leiden or had their... Uh, I think some of them actually came, some of them came from England itself too. If I'm if I'm not uh, mistaken on that, there were the Leiden uh, ones, and there were some that were still in England too. And some some of them had to be left behind because the Speedwell had to go back as well. Yes. More of them were going to come. In your research, did you find did you find anything out that did when Squanto knew one of the passengers, he knew he knew Stephen Hopkins, right mm -hmm. from. Jamestown, perhaps. And yeah. did, he, you know, did you find out at all in any of your research whether or not Squanto stayed with the Hopkins family when he was there? Uh, uh, no, the I, I, I didn't even know that. I didn't know that he knew Stephen Hopkins, to tell you the truth. Oh, no, yes. He, yeah. he was, uh, they were familiar with each other. Um, yeah. Because Stephen Hopkins, of course, had been to Jamestown and was shipwrecked right. in Bermuda. This was his right. second. And that's where Dermer ended up, and Squanto didn't go down to Virginia with Dermer, from what I, I had found. Um, Dermer the, the died down there. curiosity comes from the fact that he, I'm just one of maybe several here that I know there are Doty, Edward Doty descendants. Yep. Um, he was a servant of the Hopkins. He actually signed the Mayflower Compact, and I've always been curious of whether or not Squanto was a bunkmate, perhaps, of... Uh, <laughs> Of my grand, my grand, well, nine times great grandfather. <laughs> um, I well, uh, as you know, Habamock uh, put his home site near the village, so uh, I don't know if he stayed with Habamock or if he stayed with uh, the Pilgrims. Probably before Habamock built his home site, he had to stay someplace. So uh, that that's up for debate. I don't know. But mm -hmm. It could be. Yeah. We know, we know that Bradford was very close with uh, Squanto. In fact, later on when Squanto betrayed Massasoit, um, Bradford went against the treaty and protected Squanto. So maybe, maybe stay with Bradford, who knows? Christopher, a little off topic. Have you done any work on the uh, Beavis that was the second boat that came over? Um, what was it again? Um, have you done any research, it's not the Mayflower, but the second ship that came over from England, the Beavis? No. no that no, landed no. In, in Weymouth Landing? Do you know anything about that? Okay. Um, or anybody that might know that? The, you mean the one that brought the West, West Augusta colonists over? Yeah. Um, 
I don't think so. It was, it came, they came in from England, but I'm not sure where. Right. Um, um, actually, maybe I, I, I yeah. look at this. No, I haven't. Okay. Do you know of anybody else that might have done that work? Mm, I, I would uh, probably check with Plymouth Plantation. They probably have uh, oh, of of course. information on all that. Yeah. Because yeah. my ancestor came over on the second ship. The second ship. Yeah, and actually, one of their that descended became married. He uh, was the her husband died, and Bradford's wife died, and they married. So oh, okay. her name was Alice Carpenter. So yeah. I was kind of trying to track that back. It's, but it's anyway, interesting. Thank you. Uh, a lot of these folks that are descendants are descendants of multiple uh, Mayflower people. Yes, there, there wasn't there weren't too many people there to marry. <laughs> that's yeah. right and they knew each other back in england that's how that came about yes yeah so anyway, thank you so much for your presentation thank you i'm sorry i couldn't help right. you with your question can i ask a question to um barbara latham are you still here barb yes i am all right so it's you put down i believe that you are related to eight on the mayflower mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. I'm hoping you're not going to ask me which eight because I do have that written down. Oh, I know it's God. Mary Chilton and and her dad and mother, I guess, that died really quickly. Mm -hmm. And then there are others. Um, oh, goodness. Francis Cook. Mm -hmm. And it's all through my great, great, great grandfather, Isaac Blackmore. Mm -hmm. And there was a paper done in Pennsylvania of Isaac Blackmore of Wayne County, and it took him right back to these eight people on the Mayflower, and the paper was just brilliant and said people can be proud that this was your ancestor who connected you to so many grand, wonderful pilgrims. So I'm very grateful for that research paper done, and that taught me very recently that this is pretty special to me. That's wonderful. Well, that, that's great. Um, and I wanted to ask Charles, are you still here? Uh, Charles Doty, yes. Yes. Um, so it seems like there are a lot of you here, or not a lot, but you know, a few of you. The other but, Edward Doty cousins here. Yeah. The name is not familiar to me. Is is that a name we should know, or Ed, Ed, Edward Doty? Edward Doty was a servant. He was a uh, apprentice to Stephen Hopkins, which was one of the largest families on the Mayflower. Okay. Wasn't there a marker a over in Burial Hill, too? Flower. And um, was in, uh, I thought maybe, I was even going to ask uh, Christopher if he would talk about if he knew about the first duel in Plymouth Plantation or the New Plymouth between the two cousins, Edward Doty and Edward Lister. Hmm. Reportedly over Constance Hopkins, and, uh, and their, their, their punishment was that they were going to be they would be tied together for twenty four hours at their ankles and their wrists, oh. and, they, <laughs> and uh, they whined and apparently were released a few hours later. Yeah. But um, uh, they were both. I, I know Edward Doty. There's no doubt in any but in any Doty's mind that Edward Doty was a strong young man. Probably played a big part in, in helping the survival of uh, 50 that did survive that first winter. Um, Isn't there a Doty House marker on yeah. the fringe yes. of Burial Hill yeah. as well? Not too far from the Alden marker. I think my cousin Susan was about to probably say something. Okay. No, I I I feel like I've read that, uh, but um, I you know I'm only fairly recently acquainted with this Edward Doty heritage. It was something I found that my grandmother had left, and I found it in the last couple of years. So, well, I, I, I know that. you're a member of our. Well, it, despite the fact he wasn't a pilgrim, our uh, we have a pilgrim Edward Doty Society. Mm -hmm. There are a couple thousand members that students remember. And uh, mm -hmm. I have to be the newsletter editor uh, for that society. I think he was a pilgrim, just not a separatist, right? He was not. He was not a pilgrim. He, I think he just was trying to make a new life for himself. Right. Um, so. He was. He was an, a tanner apprentice with Stephen Hopkins. Yeah, he was an indentured servant. Something yep. I read mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, but I think that they all. I think that, 
Anyone that arrived on the Mayflower was considered a pilgrim. Because yeah. they, they weren't pilgrims at the time, considered it was, they were given that name, that title later. But I was going to show you, I don't know if anybody has read this book yet. It's just recently was out by Sue Allen. It's called In the Shadow of Men, and it's about the women pilgrims. Um, and I was just thinking, uh, Jean, was it you who was asking, are talking about the one who married, who came later on the different ship? No, that that wasn't me. Okay. Thank you for sharing that, though. That's very yes. nice. I'll look it up. Yeah, it's just, just she just published it about a month or so ago. And um, Thank you. I'm uh, the, actually the president of Soul Kindred. And we're going to be having our virtual reunion November 14th, and she'll be one of our presenters. That's great. Excellent. Wow, this has been great tonight. Yes. Um, it's very exciting to have, you know, descendants here and all this information. And, um, it's just wonderful. And uh, does anybody have any more questions or want to tell a story or talk about your your relatives or your descendants or anybody I think else? I had a question about the so I now understand that the story of Mary Chilton being the first girl to step out on Plymouth Rock is probably a total myth. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not going to start my video because I'm in my PJs. <laughs> yeah. We all have a lot of family stories, and um, mm -hmm. yes, make, that's, make that's all fascinating. This, uh, enjoyable. As long as you always preface it with, uh, I think this might be true. <laughs> the legend has it that <laughs> yes, it's <Yeah>. said. <laughs> Wow, when did the women come on board? When did the women come on land? How soon did they come on land? Probably after they went back and brought them back um, after that first uh, expedition. I mean, the third expedition. Um, we don't know when they first came in. I don't think there's any uh, record. Probably, okay. um, they probably had to get that um, first house set up, I would think, before they do that. Okay. That's, that's my guess. Uh, a lot of them remained on the Mayflower for a while. Uh, Bobby Cheshire, you're still there? Uh, yes, I am. What can you tell us? Well, my most, I have a, quite a few, but my most direct is uh, <clears throat> Peregrine White, William White, who was mm -hmm. born on the Mayflower. Mm -hmm. And he um, married, moved to Marshfield, and his daughter married a young and moved to Situate, and my grandmother's maiden name was Young. Oh. So that's one of many. I also am a Doty descendant, too. You are. Along with Warren, Bradford, uh, Alden. There's, I think there's six or seven altogether. Very cool. Kind of cool, yeah. yeah. Ro Robert, was yes. there a White's Ferry down in um, Amaral? Yes. The yeah, White, I, yes. I think it was taken over eventually by Robert Barker, who eventually ended up in Pembroke. Mm -hmm. well, I just Pembroke that. was actually part of Situate at one time. Yes, yeah, it all was so. Right. And Peregrine's house is it's, there's a marker that's still there that was actually before the new mouth of the North River. You went by the house on the South River. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I lived up there for a couple of years. It was a wonderful place. Oh, here we go. There you are. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Christopher, I'm interested in some of the maps that you mm. display. Yes. You marked on them, but yep. do you have any way to, that we can have access to that? Or oh, yep. yeah. Um, those are not in the little pamphlet I have, but the the Dexter map that I used to plot out all of the explorations. That's, uh, you can find that on archive.org, um, and that's the, the 1865 edition of Mort's Relations. I have some. I, I, yeah. I also I did a presentation for the Mayflower Society, pretty much like what you did, following mm -hmm. all the sites on Cape Cod and then to Plymouth. Um, but I, to see the actual, like, 
Cape Cod and when you drew where the paths were, that to me was right. pretty exciting. That yeah, I, and what is too. this pamphlet you're talking about? I, I uh, it's it's on my website at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, it's for people that want to visit these sites, and it's a it's a Google Doc, and you can just download it. And, uh, okay. It's, it's got GPS coordinates. It's got street addresses. Uh, if you're like me, I'm very tactile. I have to go to these places and, and stand there. Uh, I'm like that. Uh, I have to touch things and be there. Yeah, I'm a tour director also, so <laughs> I, have, yeah. I have to go see these places. Right, right. I, but I, I live in Kansas. I, I'm, I'm surprised. Uh, there's probably somebody out there doing a tour, but not these days with COVID, I guess. Yeah. No, no. Everything's yeah. canceled. In fact, most of my tour companies have canceled clear through next year. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sadly. Um, some of the other maps I found on, um, oh, it's Plymouth Arc. Dot org. It's the, uh, oh, what was his name? He used to be the uh, uh, archaeologist over at Plymouth Plantation. Maybe somebody can help me with this. Um, his son's an archaeologist down at uh, Jamestown. But a lot of those maps are from that, that site. It's a really great site. I think it's called PlymouthArc.org, something like that. Are, are those paths that you showed, are those a Google Earth file or some sort? Are uh, the satellite maps? Uh, yeah, or, yeah. The, or the paths that you drew. Yes, uh, in my booklet, yeah, I just took some Google Earth. Uh, hopefully Google won't sue me, but I'm not getting any money out of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay, I wouldn't worry about it. Those are just Google maps. Yeah. I'm just showing another, this is my favorite book, Thanksgiving by Glenn Cheney. And it goes day by day through the first year. And I was just thinking oh. if I look through here, I might find when he thinks the women came ashore. Who's it by? Yes. Glenn yes. Cheney. Cheney? Yeah. I had a, my, my book club read this a couple of years ago, and then he joined us virtually for a, um, our book club one evening mm -hmm. and signed all the copies and sent them to us. Oh, that sounds like a great resource. Yeah, he, he is. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's written a lot of books. Um, not all about pilgrims mm -hmm. necessarily, but um, but anyhow, that's another Thanks. good uh, resource. Great. Thank you. Uh, Sharon, are you still there? Hello. Sharon? Hmm? Maybe you're not? Okay. Will this be, um, I know you're recording this, will this be available at all for anyone to yes, watch? Yes, no. Probably within a day or so, you'll be able to find it. Um, I will put it up on um, the Situate Historical Society Facebook page. Okay. And Thanks. you'll be able to find it on YouTube under um, Situate Television. It'll be on the YouTube channel as well. Probably, Seth, what do you think? A day or so? Within 24 hours. Within 24 <laughs> hours. There you go. Thank you. I had to cut out for the last five minutes because of a phone call, so I want to watch it. Yep, but it will be up there. So anybody else want to... Okay, so Sharon isn't live. All right. I just wanted to ask you about your um, descendants, if you... Is she going to say anything? Uh, maybe not. All right. Anybody else? I'm here. Who's that? <laughs> uh, Katie Stella. I, I'm a William Brewster. Okay. Cool. Yes. Anybody else have that in their line, I guess? My husband. Uh, my husband's a William Brewster. Descendant. My mother did a lot of research years ago, and I've never, I've never documented it. But we're supposed to be just John, Priscilla, Miles, <laughs> and Francis Cook. But I need to. I really need to start working on that. Sure. That documented. I have it. I have it. The in writing, but you know, my mother's notes, and that's all I have. Yeah. Right. 
Well, that's valuable to have those notes. Yeah. And I can tell you, mm -hmm. I went to I went to college in Ohio, and my freshman college roommate was from the Cleveland area. Uh, I went to visit them uh, during semester break. They had a plaque on their living room wall uh, that they were Mayflower descendants, and they were so proud of that. You know, <laughs> growing up in the Plymouth area, you know, it wasn't a big deal to me, but to them, it was so important. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. There's a lot of us. <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> yes, there are. Well, this is great. This has been a wonderful evening. And um, Chris, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for all coming. Thank you I, I think much. I've learned a little bit too. Yes, and thank yes. you all for joining us. It was great hearing your stories and um, we hope you enjoyed it. And um, Christopher will be back with us again next year. We haven't decided what the topic's going to be, but um, he'll be back again. Thank so you. if you just follow us on the um, Situate Historical Society Facebook page, you'll get all the information on what we have coming up. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.